going through there on the board. Uh, first of all, the, there is no evening service here this evening, but uh, there are evening services in other congregations, and that was up on the board. Actually, I'll be speaking this evening in Dervik at half seven. <coughs> I encourage you to attend the other evening worship in different locations for their encouragement and for your own. Then this week we have a special presbytery meeting in the church hall. That's on Wednesday at half past seven. Next Lord's Day, the prayer time on the conference call as usual, 11 o'clock, and our morning worship at 12 noon. So do remember uh, the prayer time and join with us for that time. <clears throat> Don't think there's any other announcements particularly needed. <clears throat> Let's just take a few minutes as we would come to worship God. Let us uh, take a moment. <clears throat> call to worship as you see in Hosea chapter 3 afterwards the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and they shall come in fear of the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days so we come to worship God and to worship his name and we're going to do so as we sing praise from Psalm 97 Psalm 97 we begin this psalm the Lord reigns what an exclam exclamation of, of what we believe. The Lord, he does reign. And so the whole earth should rejoice. And we look forward to rejoicing with God's people as the Lord reigns. The psalmist goes on to speak about the worshippers of images being put to shame. Worthless idols, other gods, they will bow before the mighty Lord our king but zion the people of god will be joyful the lord is high above all the earth and it is to him we come with our worship psalm 97 we sing stanzas one to five the tune is warrington number 37 let us praise god together
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we rejoice today that we can come in this confidence the Lord reigns, that Jesus Christ has conquered our enemy, Satan, and all who are his, and will conquer all who are opposed to the truth of the living God. And so with the psalmist, we as Zion are joyful because we see your judgments and we are assured, O God, that while at times we face difficulty and trial and hard times in our faith, yet we have a God who will bring us into his presence and kingdom in the end and we will be triumphant in Jesus Christ. And Father, as we come to worship you today, we pray that it will be for our encouragement and blessing that we would know you, our God, to walk in your paths and to magnify your name. So Lord, bless us in our worship. Speak to us. Challenge and rebuke our sin. For Father, we are must confess that we come to you not as people worthy but as unworthy not as people who have been perfect even in the past hours but as imperfect yet we come through jesus christ rejoicing that you as our gracious father receive us and are ready to meet with us so lord hear our prayer and bless us in jesus name we ask amen We are turning this morning to the book of Obadiah, and so I'd ask you to turn to Obadiah, and we're going to read from Obadiah and this single chapter of God's Word. Obadiah comes just after Amos. It's one of those little difficult books in the Old Testament to find because it's just a page, and if you turn two pages, you'll have missed it. Obadiah just coming after Amos and before Jonah, the shortest of the prophets of the Old Testament. We turn to Obadiah. Let us read God's word. Obadiah, reading from verse 1. Let us hear the word of God. The vision of Obadiah. This is what the sovereign Lord says about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, Rise, and let us go against her for battle. See, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights. You who say to yourself, Who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if robbers in the night, oh, what a disaster awaits you. Would they not steal only as much as they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave a few grapes? But how Esau will be ransacked, his hidden treasures pillaged. All your allies will force you to the border. Your friends will deceive and overpower you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you, but you will not detect it. In that day, declares the Lord, will I not destroy the wise men of Edom? men of understanding in the mountains of Esau. Your warriors, O Teman, will be terrified, and everyone in Esau's mountains will be cut down in the slaughter. Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloof, while strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. You should not look down on your brother, 
in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. You should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, nor look down on them in their calamity in the day of their disaster, nor seize their wealth in the day of their disaster. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives, nor hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. Just as you drank on my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy, and the house of Jacob will possess its inheritance. The house of Jacob will be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. The house of Esau will be stubble, and they will set it on fire and consume it. There will be no survivors from the house of Esau. The Lord has spoken. People from the Negev will occupy the mountains of Esau, and people from the foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. This company of Israelite exiles who are in Canaan will possess the land as far as Zarephath. The exiles from Jerusalem who are in Shepherd will possess the towns of the Negev. Deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau. And the kingdom will be the Lord's. Amen. We pray that God will bless to us his own word. Let us again come before God in prayer. Let us approach our Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, you are from everlasting to everlasting, and we worship and exalt you, for you have given us life and existence and lead us in the way of eternal life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour. Lord God, we plead with you that you, having given us Jesus, will continue to be with us, leading and helping us by the Holy Spirit. May he, the Spirit of Christ, dwell within us and keep us in the way of the Lord. Father, you know the world in which we are called to live. You know the hostility that there is against you and your truth. You know the ways of unrighteousness in which many walk. And we have to contend with them, O God, by your grace. Lord, forgive us for our faults and for all our failures. Forgive us, O God, when we have arrogantly spoken, when we have not been humble before you as we ought, but have thought far too much of ourselves. Speak to our hearts, O God, that we might bow before you, the God of all the earth, and realize that we are nothing without Christ. And so we are utterly, utterly dependent upon him. So lead us away from all corruption, O God, that we might seek to do what is righteous in your sight, what is good and pleasing to our God, and what is for the good of one another and for those who yet do not know you, that they might see Jesus lifted up and exalted in our lives. So, Lord, we pray you will build up your people, build up your church by your Spirit in these days. Strengthen us that we may be faithful to the truth of the gospel and the way of God. Lord, we pray 
that you will enable us in these days within our society to be unashamed of standing for Christ and the truth. Father, we would pray for those who lead us in these days. We recognize the difficulties, the, the change of leadership that there is going to be over the coming months. Lord, we pray that you will give wisdom to those who are brought into positions of power. Heavenly Father, they may not recognize you, but you are the one who will direct their very paths in your eternal purposes. And we would pray, O God, that your hand will be upon them, that they would seek to rule in justice and righteousness. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will cause them to do what is good, even with regards to the economic situation in which our land, indeed the world, is in. We pray, Heavenly Father, that though it may be painful for some, may they do what is right, that God might be uh, in control, and that the poor might have all that they need, that the rich will be ready to give to those who have need. Father, we look to you and pray you will overrule. And yet, Father, we have so much to thank you for. You have blessed us in so many ways. We look to the land of Ukraine, invaded by an enemy. And we would pray for those people, O oh God, many have left and have left all behind them. We cry out to you, O God, for them, that your hand will be upon them, that you might supply their every need. We pray, O God, for your grace to them. We pray especially that it will be a time of opportunity for them to hear not just of practical provision, but of spiritual provision through the things of God in his word. Lord, use your people who are witnessing to those who have fled from home, to those who are witnessing back in Ukraine itself. May the precious word of God bear much fruit, bringing peace with God, though there may be fear of man. Gracious God, we come to you with our own needs as a people of God. Father, we bow before you, and we would ask that you will give us wisdom. We pray you will bear us up by your Spirit in this congregation. Where we need to be challenged, challenge us. Where we need rebuked, rebuke us. Where we need encouraged, Lord, speak to our hearts by your word. Comfort us, O Lord, when we need that comfort. We think of those who are still feeling the pain of separation of loved ones who have been taken from this world. And we pray that the comfort of our God will be near to them that you will bless them. We pray for those, O oh God, who are uh, in their homes, unable to go far or get out at all. We just commit them to you that in your grace they may know your presence, your encouragement. Father, we would pray for challenge to those who simply reject or re are not faithful in coming to hear your word. And Lord, may they see the need to join with us, to exalt the God, the God of grace, and to learn of him. Father, whatever our need, speak to our hearts. Bless us by your Spirit. Hear these our prayers, for we ask it in Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat> Please turn again in the Word of God. I want to read a short portion from Revelation and chapter 19. Turning to the book of Revelation, and we're going to read from chapter 19, Revelation 19, and from verse 1. <clears throat> we turn in the Word of God to Revelation chapter 19 at verse 1. Let us hear God's Word. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! 
The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne, and they cried, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both small and great. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Amen. We pray that God will bless his word to us. We're again going to turn to sing praise, returning to Psalm 50, and we're going to sing Psalm 50. Uh, stanzas 1 to 6 and the tune is Trentum number 207 turning to Psalm 50 1 to 6 here the psalmist cries out the mighty God the Lord has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to where it has its fall and here he is from Zion his high abode beautiful and then the psalmist speaks about his coming our God will surely come. He'll come, and the heavens declare his righteousness. There is a day when Christ will come in all his glory, gathering his people, those who have entered into covenant, in other words, those who have made a a true profession of faith and committed their way to Christ, those who have sacrificed and in a covenant with me, he says, they will be gathered, gathered to the kingdom of God, to the glory of his name forever. Psalm 50, we're singing stanzas 1 to 6, the tune is Trentum 207. Let us praise God together.
Well, many of you have siblings in your family. I wonder how you get on with your siblings. For many of us, it has been a real blessing to have brothers and sisters, and we get on well even when we're younger, while there's always the odd uh, bit of uh, friction. Generally speaking, we can look back and say we had a good family together, and we enjoyed having brothers and sisters in our families. What a blessing when we do get on, and even later in life, to be able to share with brothers is something that we ought to treasure. Some do not have that privilege. But of course, not every family relationship is like that. Sadly, because of our sinfulness, we know that there are those who are blood brothers in the world, but they are always at loggerheads. Their relationship is broken. They don't talk to each other. Perhaps even worse, there's a bitterness and a hatred between them. And for those of us who have had the privilege of loving families, we might find that hard to fully understand. But it is, of course, the result of sin and selfishness. And as we turn this morning to the book of Obadiah, to this shortest of prophecies in the Old Testament, it's really about two brothers. It's speaking about (coughs) Jacob and Esau. Here is a relationship that early in life went wrong, and it continued to be so right down the generation so that Esau or Edom, the descendants of Esau, were always bitter against the people of God, Jacob or Israel. And that's what this prophecy is about. It's tracing the the difficulty between Edom and Israel, but it is word of encouragement for the people of God, for those who come to know God, for the true Israel of God, because it brings to us at the end the truth that Israel will be restored. Those who are God's people will overcome all who reject and oppose the people of God. You see, here we are supposed to think, as Obadiah speaks, of Esau or Edom, not just as one people, but they are really symbolic of all the nations who oppose the people of God. And indeed, we could take that right down to the present day. Any who oppose God and his people are of the nations, and they are opposing the truth. Those who are of Jacob, or of Israel are all those who have come to know God, those who have put their faith in our day in Jesus Christ, and thereby are Israel, not by birth, but by spiritual birth, being brought as the seed of of Abraham, as those by faith who truly believe. And that's what we're looking at as we look here at this passage. Of Obadiah himself, we know very little. We don't really know much about him or who he was. And this is all we really have, this little book which is called a vision, or we could say a prophecy of Obadiah. It's written, we think, it's it's hard to be certain, taking place sometime after the destruction by Nebuchadnezzar of Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon overtook Jerusalem in about 587 BC, and Obadiah falls in somewhere and perhaps just after that. It also seems that Obadiah has read perhaps some of Jeremiah, and there is a what some think may be even quoting from Jeremiah, or at least the words that Obadiah uses are very, very similar. But what is the message then? Well, it really has to do with the downfall of Edom and the restoration of of Israel. And we're going to look at that. First of all, we see the word against Edom, and then we will note, particularly verses 10 to 14, what we might say the very reason why Edom was going to fall. And then we have a picture of the real judgment of the catastrophe that's about to fall upon Edom for the nations. 
But at the end, we come to the encouraging word, the word of the restoration of Israel. So we're looking, first of all, at Edom's doom foretold. Edom's doom is foretold by Obadiah. As he begins speaking this word from verse 1, it seems that he has already heard something of a message. There is talk, and perhaps it's here that he has read similar words in Jeremiah. But Obadiah's message is no less the word of the Lord, for he is bringing together this news that has been spreading about. And what is the message? Well, his word is that the, the nation, those who had been on Edom's side, the people who were in confederacy with Edom at a time, they are now conspiring against Edom. They had once been in cahoots with Edom, the surrounding nations, but now there's a hostility towards Edom. You have heard the message from the Lord. An envoy who is sent to the nations to say, rise, let us go against her. It's against Edom for battle. Perhaps they felt that Edom herself was getting too strong, too much uh, pride in her heart. Proud, no doubt, because of her position. And that's outlined in the next verses. Proud of the place where they were. Verse 3 speaks of their pride of heart being deceiving them. Edom, you see, was up in the clefts of the rock, a stronghold, a place that would be hard to bring down. They made their home on the heights, and of course, from the heights, you could attack the low lying ground. It's easy to defend if you have a fortress that is steep sided uh, and people have to climb to meet you. And Edom felt rather impregnable. But the word of the Lord comes in verse 4. Here's their doom. Though you soar like an eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down. And that is the word of God to Edom. That's her doom. She's going to be brought down to nothing. In all her arrogance and pride, she will be brought down and humbled. In verse 5, we have here another picture. Uh, verses 5 following, really, we have a picture of thieves. Now, when a thief will come to your house, he might break in and steal what he can readily put his hand on. He wants to be in and out quickly, I would imagine. And so the things that are easily pickings, he will lift and take. They mightn't take too much time to search round for other goods. And so often if there's a treasure hidden away, it's safe. Because the thief doesn't want to take time to, to find out those treasures. And so though he takes some, the treasures remain. The grape pickers are also the picture here. As they go over the grapes, they pick the bulk of the grapes, the big bunches. But occasionally, of course, there will be some left. What we call the gleanings. And in the Old Testament, of course, the gleanings, whether in harvest or grape, were left. Ordinary people, poor people, could come in after the harvesters and pick those single grapes, those little ones that maybe weren't just profitable, and they could use them. There was always something left. But the picture here for Edom in her doom foretold is this. There'll be no treasure left. There'll be no grapes left. And such will be the complete destruction that will come upon Edom, indeed upon the nations that we're thinking about. Esau will be ransacked, his hidden treasures pillaged. They will all be gone. Such is the extent of the complete destruction, the complete overrunning of Esau or Edom. Everything will be carried off and they will be brought down, overpowered by their enemies. Verses 8 and 9 speak of the wise men, of men of understanding. And what happens to them? Well, we find it spoken of there. I Will I not destroy them? 
God is saying, even those who are wise and full of understanding, they'll be brought to nothing. They'll be cut down. The whole sense of slaughter comes at the end of verse 9. They'll be cut down in the slaughter. Edom, you may be arrogant, you may be proud, you may think that nobody can touch you. Your doom is clear. And that's a message not just to Edom or to Esau. It is really a message to the nations. And it's a message today still to the nations who reject the way of God. And we see people today, we see nations today who might think that they're on a rocky crag. They're powerful. They can flex their muscles. No one can touch them for whatever reason. But the word of God would come to them and say, look, your doom is written. Your doom is written. You will be brought down to nothing. The treasures that you think you have are worthless or they will be pillaged. In fact, if we look back at history, we can see how this happens. And here with Edom, it was the surrounding, her own colleagues, or her own coalition breaking up, and those people who were part of it then stabbing Edom in the back, as it were. Sound familiar? Well, that's what happens. Powers rise. People rise in power, and they think they have those who are supporting them. But how quickly we have seen in our own land those who once were supportive can suddenly be the ones vying to take your job and for the place of authority. It's the same in nations. Nations have fallen throughout history because those whom they brought in in coalition have exercised power against them and broken them down sometimes from within. Why? Because the Lord God of heaven is on the throne. And today, there are many powers and authorities, many nations. And they need to be wise. They need to learn that unless they humble themselves before God, they'll be brought to nothing. There are even people, individuals perhaps even, who can think themselves untouchable, who think that they all is well. And God may be saying to them, you have, think you're on a rocky crag and no one will be near you. You'll be brought down. You reject the way of God. You reject the word of the Lord. Be sure your doom is coming. And then secondly, we want to think about why this is so. What was Edom's fault? Why all this against her? Well, we find this spoken of in verses 10 to 14. The reason for her downfall. And it's the same reason that we can apply to individuals who reject God or his word and to those nations today or who do not walk in God's way. Just look what verse 10 says. Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be destroyed forever. That, in a way, sums it up. Because of the hostility Edom, Esau showed against her brother, Jacob. It goes right back to the animosity of Jacob and Esau in Genesis 27. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. And from that, right through to Obadiah, and indeed in the present, the hostility against the people of God, hatred of the people of God, and for that, those who reject God will come to nothing. The Lord had chosen Jacob as his, and his offspring as his people. He had cared for them. He brought them and made a nation from them. But Edom, Esau, and others continue to go against them. Verse 12 continues. Um, sorry, in verse 11, we note how the day you stood aloof. Uh, here's what they did in, in 
the time whenever strangers carried off Jacob's wealth, when foreigners entered Jerusalem, what did Edom or Esau do? Did they stand up for their brother? No. They weren't to be seen. They were nowhere there. We ought, if we love our brothers, to be standing for them when they're in the truth or encouraging them to see sense if they go against the truth. But here's the brother Edom, and he stood far off. Let it happen. No response. Verse 12 uh, is perhaps somewhat different. 12 and 13, 14. It reads like uh, a series of prohibitions. Here are things you shall not do. Just look at verse 12. You should not look down on your brother in the day of his misfortune. But it's a kind of rhetorical device. It's it's saying this is what you should not have to do, but this, in fact, is the very thing that you have done. And it's saying, here's the reason, Edom, here's the reason, nations, you are going to be destroyed. Because you have not done what you ought to have done. In fact, you've done the opposite. Verse 12, you should not look down on your brother in the day of his misfortune, but that's exactly what Esau, Edom, did. They rejoiced when Judah fell into destruction. They had marched through the gates of the destroyed city. In verse 13, they had looked at the calamity and rubbed their hands with glee at the destruction of their brother. Oh, why should they not be brought to nothing because of such attitude towards their own brother? And then in verse 14, They had waited at the crossroads and they had cut down fugitives. In other words, those who might have escaped, they harbored bloodshed against them, callously dealing with them. Because of their hostility towards Jacob, towards Israel, towards the people of God, their doom was sealed. And those today who are opposed to the people of God in so many different ways are not just opposing the people of God, they are opposing God. And so whenever a man speaks in Christ's name, holding fast to Jesus as Lord, and the world criticizes that man or uh, seeks to destroy him because he loved for Christ, He is actually seeking to destroy Jesus. Remember Paul at his conversion. Think about how he was met on the road. And what were the words of the Lord to him? You are persecuting me. Paul wasn't persecuting God directly in a sense, but he was persecuting the believers. He was going out against all who were in love and following Jesus. But the Lord says to him, you're persecuting me. Because as he persecuted the people of God, he was persecuting God against God, plundering God. And today we see that even in our world. And we need to tell people, if you oppose God, you're opposing God. If you're opposing God's people, you're opposing God. Perhaps we could bring this down to an example in uh, family relationships. If we have close bonds within a family and where there is love and concern for one another, if you come and someone criticizes one member of that family and is really hard against them, well, it, it, they will look at it, and others in the family will look at it. It's against us. They will take it personally because it is opposing not just one person, but the, the whole family in a sense because they're bound together in love. And in a way, that's true. When we find people persecuting Christ's people in some other country, friends, it's a persecution against us for we love them in Jesus and we want him to be exalted. It's opposition to God. Today there are those who are proposing all kinds of things that are contrary to the will of God. 
their doom, their doom is written. In the day of the Lord's coming, their doom indeed will come. We are who are to be on the Lord's side need to be careful that we are walking close to our Savior, that we are not opposing God, but rather that we are seeking to serve him and honor him. For if we oppose someone who is in the Lord's name, we oppose the Lord. But then, thirdly, as we think about Edom's doom and the reason for it, look at the judgment that is announced. This is solemn stuff. As we read the words from verse 15 onwards, verse 15, 16, 17, Obadiah declares this, the day of the Lord is near for all nations. Now Obadiah was looking ahead. He could see the coming of Jesus Christ, but as often in the Old Testament, that coming, that first coming, is almost coalesced with the second coming. It's like you looking away into the distance and you see a mountain far off and behind it another mountain and they almost look as if they're quite close because you're looking away into the distance and yet there, there's miles and miles between them. As Obadiah looked ahead to the coming of the Lord he could see Christ, the coming day of the Lord and I believe he's speaking probably of both the coming of Christ and the second coming of Jesus. The day of the Lord is near as you have done, it will be done to you. As you have rejected the people of God, so it will be done to you. You will be rejected. Just as you drank in my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. It's an ongoing, complete and utter destruction. As if you'd never been. More than that, when we turn with Obadiah to speak about the house of Zion, he speaks there in this way, the house of Esau will be stubble and will, they will set it on fire and consume it. There will be no survivors from the house of Esau. Now, recently, last week we've had fire in England. We've seen the fires in Europe due to the heat. Fire is all consuming. We're thankful that some of those fires are able to be put out and we hope and pray any that are still burning will be put out. Stubble. We know here even if you put fire to stubble on a warm dry day it will be consumed. And that's what Edom or Esau will be under, and we should note this, under the people of God. The house of Jacob will be a fire. Why? Because we stand with our God and with our Lord. You see, the message of the gospel today is certainly good news for those who embrace it. We are in Christ, and with him we reign over our enemies, and they will all be trampled under our feet. The good news of the gospel is only good news because we know that we deserve to be banished from God's sight and in the stubble, in the fire, because of our sin. But Christ has dealt with that and brought us into Christ with whom we reign. And the judgment announced against the nations is the judgment that Jesus Christ bore on the cross that you and I might not die, but live. And so the news, the doom of the nations of Edom and others is simply this. You will be fall under the righteous, just, and holy wrath of God, and the eternal fires will consume you. What a solemn word. If you are not right with Jesus Christ as Lord, you're stubble and you'll be burnt up. And that's a word for the, not only for nations, as it is a word for nations, 
where there'll be no more. It's a word for individuals. Where do you stand before your God? Have you sought the Lord and been freed from your bondage to, and to perish under sin and brought by Christ who died to the way of righteousness? Obadiah is clear, the nations, the people, any who oppose the things of God, this is their doom and this is their destruction. He is talking about the eternal fires of the abyss of hell. That's the way for Esau. But there is a great encouragement for the people of God. Israel is restored. Israel, the people of God, find much blessing. Verse 17, but on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy, and the house of Jacob will possess its inheritance. The people of Israel grew as a nation in Egypt and were brought out through the wilderness to the promised land. They received their inheritance. They were brought to the place God would provide for them. But that in Israel was only a symbolic thing in a sense because it speaks of a far greater inheritance. It speaks of God bringing all his people faithful from the Old Testament and the New Testament era into the promised land of heaven itself, into the inheritance that is promised, and we will possess it. We will reign with Christ in glory, in the day that he comes. Yes, verse 18 describes Jacob as a fire because we will long with God will be reigning over all his and our enemies as we dwell on the throne with Jesus Christ, our brother, our Lord, and the one through whom we have gained victory over death. And then the last three verses here show the people of God coming to occupy the territory of their enemies. In other words, the enemy is no more. You just could look at those people from the Negev will occupy the mountains of Esau. No hindrance. They will occupy the territory. The people from the foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. God's people will be there. They will occupy the fields of Ephraim and so on. Verse 20, the company of the Israelite exiles who are in Canaan will possess the land as far as Zarephah. The exiles of Jerusalem who are in Shepherd will possess the towns of the Negev. God's people restored to the rightful place. Sometimes in this world you and I feel downtrodden. We feel as though we don't we don't really belong here. Neither we do. We are but uh, people passing through this world. It's not our permanent home. We will not dwell here forever. We're only too well aware of that. We are but sojourners. But we will come. We will come to our inheritance in the day of Christ. For when Christ comes, all who are his will be with him forever. Why those who have already passed into glory are already uh, with him by this in their souls. Their bodies will be raised, spiritual bodies. And we look forward to the great day of his coming when body and soul will be united with Christ in our inheritance forever. What a joy. That's our encouragement. Therefore, it is worth putting up with the brickbacks of the wicked of standing square against the wicked counsel of the godless in our day and of saying to them, look, you have lost. Your doom is written because of your hostility to God. The judgment will come, everlasting judgment. Will you not think again, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? For he is the only hope. It is he and his people who will be restored and brought to the kingdom of God. And that's the note on which we end, the very end of Obadiah. And the kingdom will be the Lord's. Yes, it's the Lord's kingdom. It's not my kingdom. 
It's the Lord's kingdom. And what we do in service and honor for Christ is all because it is his. He has gained it. He is Lord of glory. Friends, will you flee the judgment to come? Will you take note that the day of the Lord is upon us? Will you not come to magnify his name and cry out, Lord, may may Jesus be my Savior, that through him I'll be restored into the presence of my God for fellowship and for eternity and escape the wrath Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are encouraged as the people of God when we see this prophecy, for it reminds us that we are the victors through Jesus Christ, and that the world and all its hatred and uh, rebellion against us, though we are with them as brothers in the world, as men and women created of God, yet, O Lord, we, we know their doom. O Lord, we would long that many would turn to Jesus, that they would escape the wrath to come, that they would come and know the shelter of Christ and his mercy and forgiveness. But Lord, we know that in your righteousness and in your power, the day of the Lord will come and all who oppose you will be burned up like stubble and cast out of your presence. So, Father, may we make our calling and election sure. May we be come to you even today to repent again of our sin and to seek afresh Jesus Christ and his forgiveness, that we might be restored every single day into the very presence of our God. Lord, hear our prayers. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. We're going to turn to Psalm 9 to sing praise. Psalm 9, we sing from stanza 1 to 5, the tune, uh, To God Be the Glory, 2, 9, 8. Psalm 9, here's the psalm speaking of the nations. Wholehearted thanksgiving to you I will bring. In praise of your marvelous works I will sing. For joy I will shout and exultantly cry. In praise of your name, Lord my God, O Most High. Why? Why do we praise God? My enemies turn back in utter despair. They stumbled and perished because you were there. You defended my right. And God does defend his people and goes before them. He will deal with the nations. He will reign over them righteously. The Lord is a stronghold, a refuge for those who truly seek him. Psalm 9, 1 to 5, the tune 298, let us praise God together.
receive the Lord's blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with God's people now and always.